Thank you, Paul and, and Matt, for the generous invitation to be part of um, the collaborative. And, and I get to do something that I'm really passionate about today, and that's talk about the cancer service of the future that we're developing um, globally. Um, it started as, a, as an idea to reimagine how we might provide radiation oncology or cancer services uh, if we could start again. So a little bit like um, building the lake and the bridge, we thought, how could we reimagine cancer services um, and how could we do it where the patient is centred and all the services that are around the patient deliver excellence in care. So that's really what Cancer Service of the Future is. And I guess it really comes off um, our vision and values, which I know you've seen and it's in a copy of your documentation, but I guess to me what really resonates um, deeply and personally is that very first statement about Genesis Care being founded to have a pr profound impact on human health. That's what drives me. That's why I really love talking about Cancer Service of the Future because it does have a profound um, impact on the people that we look after and their families and you know I'm very fortunate to be able to be in the role I am and I just get up every day and just try and live these values and if that's one thing that you can take away from the presentation is get a sense of the energy that this can bring it is really transformational so thanks for the invitation Paul and Matt and hopefully um, I can give you in the next 15 or so minutes a bit of a view about what my job is and how I'm trying to really change life in a profound way. A little bit about Australia, um, it's an interesting market. I guess the first thing is that um, we're a very big landmass and as you can see from this slide, um, our radiotherapy centres, of which there are 27 scattered across five Australian states, um, are, are really populated around where people live and there's a whole lot of landmass where there are no centres but fortunately there's not a lot of people that live in those areas. But um, we are, uh, as you can see, in Western Australia, South Australia, Victoria, New South Wales and, and, Western, and Queensland. As I said, 27 sites, 55 linear accelerators. We, we have a, a 20% of the linear accelerator holding in Australia, but we deliver care to about 33% of patients. So we do bat above our weight in Australia in terms of delivering services um, disproportionately to our hold of equipment. Uh, we have about 700 employees, which includes doctors, therapists, physicists, dosimetrists, nurses, patient services, engineers. Uh, we've got a full gamut of staff. Uh, and we deliver around 350,000 attendances across the 12-month the period. Um, and that equates to um, around about, per, per LINAC, around about 40 patients per LINAC per day. So that's sort of how those numbers come up. Um, we're private, so we receive very little in the way of government funding. Most of our patients uh, pay for their services and private health insurance in Australia does not contribute to the cost of radiotherapy. So for, for, for our service to survive, we have to provide a high quality, highly efficient service and it has to differentiate itself from our public competitors who give away treatment for free uh, because uh, patients are paying for their treatment. But progressively over the last two years, we've been invited by the government to provide services under contracted arrangements. So we've now got eight of those agreements in place and we are able to deliver, deliver services at about a third of the price of the public sector. So we're winning more and more contracts uh, in Australia as a result of our value proposition. And we're tied very closely to performance measures. So if we don't deliver, we don't get paid. Um, having said that, we actually love what we do. So we really try and deliver services in line with our vision and we look at improvement and innovation as being key of what we do. Um, we really have valued safety and quality and governance and we're building that in and we're really focusing on patient outcomes and that's really what we do. And that transpires into you know, 47 clinical trials. 12 months ago we had five. So we're starting to build quality and access into our services. In the last three years, our clinicians, therapists, physicists, dosimetrists have uh, contributed to over a thousand peer-reviewed publications and we're now partnering with our national research organisation, TROG, to really start to drive the quality agenda and the research agenda by delivering our own studies. Because we do look after a third of the patients in Australia that have radiation, we've got a great opportunity to really bend the curve in terms of outcomes. So what is Cancer Service of the Future? Uh, I've talked a little bit about it being a really exciting place. Um, you know, and, and you've probably seen this slide before, but it really is about taking our values of 
um, innovation and transformation and driving that in quality. So we, we, d we absolutely want to build a high quality service. We want to create access. That could be where there are no services. So that could be building centres where there are populations underserviced by access to bunkers. Or it could be providing services such as VMAP where those services or stereo tactic or deep inspiration breath hold where they don't exist. And, and the way that we do that is with a real key eye around efficiency. Uh, we, we believe we have to be efficient to be able to survive in a marketplace where our funding is very much different to our public competitors. And so without the efficiency, uh, building in with quality and access, our services uh, are not able to transform and survive. So there's a massive amount of opportunity, but I think if we get cancer service of the future right, it will actually be a model that can grow into any of the areas that, that we provide services, including China, as you probably would have heard recently, we, we introduced a new strategic partner to Genesis Care. It's a consortium of China Resources Group and the Macquarie Bank. And obviously the China Resources Group are very keen to implement services into China where there is massive need. And so this model of Cancer Service the Future will hopefully provide a really strong, high quality platform to provide those services. Um, we didn't invent Cancer Service of the Future. What we tried to do was identify where there were pockets of best practice globally and bring them together. And Dan Collins describes this as the greatest hits. If you could go around and compile an album of greatest hits, this is what Cancer Service of the Future is. And there's just six examples I quickly want to run through where we found best practice. Um, this is a, a very small centre in Laval, which is in Montreal, that has a strong discipline around care pathways. Every one of their treatment protocols is completely scripted and protocolised, right down to the fact that breast patients that have the prognostic indicators all get genetic screening, right down to the fact that breast patients that have had anthracyclines are on an exercise program that involves cardio-oncology health. So very strong discipline around care pathways and all automated so that everyone is on protocol and patients that do fall off protocol get identified very quickly and measures are instituted to address those, uh, those patients that do come off protocol. Really interesting site that we saw in, in Toronto, Sunnybrook, about 15 miles from Princess Margaret, um, was at risk of being uh, I guess overtaken by Princess Margaret and really established its own presence through a rapid access service. I hadn't seen it, um, I couldn't believe it, but where, where appropriate, where patients are consented, they can do a, a plan and start treatment within a 45 minute window. And that's palliative, breast, prostate, head and neck. It is truly transformational. So if patients are ready to start, they can come in and in 45 minutes they're simmed, planned, QA'd, treated, truly transformational. Um, McLaren come on us, which is in Detroit, um, Michigan. Again, a really strong culture around reporting outcomes. So measuring what they do, quality of life, treatment toxicity, um, you know, every gamut of outcome is reported and published. And to the extent that McLaren was a tier two hospital in the North American health system, um, achieving a different level of funding to the MD Andersons and um, the Memorial Sloan Ketterings, but through their outcome reporting mechanism were elevated to a tier one and are the only private institution in the North American con in continent that are actually now a tier one hospital and funded at the same level as the MD Andersons. Um, but they didn't chase the dollars, they chased the quality and the dollars came as an outcome. Uh, the Christie here in the UK, really strong culture around research and quality. Um, we learned a lot around how to automate clinical trials through the Christie, and that's been part of, I guess, why we've seen clinical trial numbers increase and, and why we think that'll be the next step in getting more patients onto clinical trials is because we, we can automate. Um, and, and they employed gamers, really interesting guys, young guys straight out of the gaming industry that were developing code and programs to really draw data down from Mosaic and develop up. Really, it's easy ways to identify patients for clinical trials, automating the CRFs so that when it came to reporting to the clinical trial centres, that was a button push, not someone having to print off a form and fill in the boxes. Um, there's a, there was a centre in Metz, you met Carlos. So I, I heard Carlos talk about this first time at, at Estra a few years ago and talked about treating 70 patients on a LINAC in a normal day. How could you do that? Um, fortunately, we went to Metz and had a look and saw it. Three machines, 210 patients a day, and it was calm. It was like a day spa, and it was purely patient-centric, yet very efficient and high quality. And um, you know, it was just amazing to try and think about how we could replicate that. And then uh, a centre in Germany, in Lake Constance, where there's a strong 
uh, push towards automating uh, QA to the extent that they could now enter the adaptive market. And it was an interesting centre that's starting to lead a bit in that space. And, um, you know, I think the concept of planning a patient on a scan that's T minus 10 and, and, and using that plan all the way through the patient is a paradigm that applies last year. And I think for next year we need to think about adaptive measures. And I think there's a talk today that um, you'll hear a little bit more about that. So, you know, Cancer Service of the Future is an ambitious project. It's, it's got a lot of key indicators. I'll just pick off a couple, but it involves you know, around quality leadership development programs for our staff, including our doctors. It includes patient satisfaction of greater than 90%. It includes 5%, at least 5% of patients in, enrolled on clinical trials. It's very ambitious. From an access perspective, you know, that five, so at the moment we're seven days average of getting a curative patient onto treatment. We want to get that down to five days. That's going to take a little while for us to get there, but uh, we'll, we're putting the systems in place. We'd love to be able to offer rapid access for our palliative patients same day. We think we'll be able to do that next year. Um, high utilisations of, of IMRT and VMAT. In terms of efficiency, you know, improved LINAC utilisation. 40 patients, can we do 45 patients and can we do that efficiently? And, and can we standardise care at the level of 90% so that all patients are on a care pathway? Um, this is a case study that brings together a, a number of the Cancer Service of the Future, future initiatives. This is a very unfortunate patient, um, an 84-year-old Italian man that had been bumped around um, where I live in Melbourne um, from two public hospitals, went to a public hospital where um, he was just not able to be treated with IMRT. He then went to another hospital where they did have IMRT, and this, this unfortunate man had disease tracking from his orbit right down into his chest. Um, he went to the second facility in Melbourne, and they looked at a plan involving some IMRT, some electrons. Uh, it was going to take them two weeks to plan this poor unfortunate chap. He, it would have taken them another week to do some quality assurance. Uh, it would have taken them, would have taken about 40 minutes per, per day to deliver the treatment. I had a phone call, uh, I, and I remember the day, um, one of the consultants rang me from this hospital and said, you know, what can you do? I said, send in the images. He dicommed in the images. Within 40 minutes, we had a plan ready to go, a full VMAP plan, um, and he started the next day. So instead of even waiting three weeks and being on the couch 40 minutes each day, we got this chap on treatment within one day, and he was only on the couch for five minutes, a single rotation. And, and you can see there were some very... Uh, difficult geometries to treat in this patient, um, including avoiding a, avoiding a pacemaker, but um, we were able to do it. And, and the consultant clearly said that he felt the VMAP plan on this palliative patient were better than the IMRT plans that he saw on his curative patients. So this is how you know, we're, we're getting there. Um, and as you know, the Cancer Service of the Future is about scalability. It's not just about what happens in Melbourne or what happens in um, Manchester, it's about what happens across the world and I think we've got a social responsibility to try and bring some of this to the, glo to the global communities and, and you, know, you know some of this data that where most of the people live there are no services so what we're trying to do is build something that we can scale and deliver globally and you can see by the pink there is massive opportunity to be able to do that. Unfortunately you know the West is over-serviced and the rest of the world is under-serviced so we've got a massive opportunity and the spend is significantly different. So in the Western world, you can see the spend in terms of gross domestic product compared to the, to the rest of the world. So we've got to deliver a sustainable, low-cost, high-quality model, and that's what cancer service of the future is. Um, this is just how we do it in, in Australia. This is essentially my job description. I, I project manage three streams of cancer service of the future, but I oversight a number of others. Um, and I largely spend a lot of time in the care pathways and outcomes reporting space, but then I'm also involved in a lot of the automation, because we can't actually deliver this with automation. Um, but, you know, it's all about driving cancer service of the future, and as I said, our, our goal is to really do a number of things across the whole quality access and efficiency domain, and patient care and satisfaction is one of those. Our goal is to be 90%. I hear, Paul, you said, you know, yours is above the 90% mark. We're tracking there. In 2014, we were 70%. You know, in September we were 87% and we're getting to the 90% mark. And we're doing that through a range of initiatives. We're refurbing our centres, but we're doing simple things like just start, simple things like say hello as you walk down the corridor. You know, we were noticing that some of our staff were so busy their heads were down that they weren't even recognising patients. So just doing the simple things can turn things pretty quickly and, and it's 
how we think we'll get to 90% is through 100 little things, not one big thing. Um, in terms of outcome reporting, where I spend a lot of time, it's about gaining clinical consensus with our clinicians across Australia. Uh, we've got over 70 full-time doctors working in Australia, and it's how do you get 70 doctors to agree on how to best treat a cohort of patients. And so what we're trying to do is build these clinical consensus guidelines. We then try and automate the pathways uh, through a whole bunch of initiatives in Mosaic, such as IQ Scripts. We want to collect data, so we're building portals and IT interfaces to do that. And then we want to present that data back to our clinicians to use to try and bend the curve on quality and, and outcomes. That's a very big part of, of, of what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. The foundation, you know, we, we now know with, gen, with uh, the new partners coming on board that the, Ge the Genesis Care Foundation has kicked off and um, there's a $5 million seed funding allocation to start uh, that initiative off and we're looking forward to getting some support for research and access through the foundation. Um, Accreditation is very big in Australia, um, coming off a very low base. Uh, most of our sites now are accredited by the National uh, Auditing Committee and uh, we're glad to say that we'll have our final two sites fully accredited by uh, probably the end of December, which will be a fantastic initiative. We'll be the only organisation in Australia that's fully accredited. We're investing in leadership development. You can see on the right on the on the side there where you've got all the individual images. There's some of our doctors that are, that we're taking through leadership programs. Each of those doctors are really keen to be leaders, and they're really trying to really contribute in a way that excites them as well. So each of those doctors have projects, um, implementing stereo tactic, implementing deep inspiration breath hold. Um, you know, standardising care pathways for breast patients. Every one of those doctors has a project which helps to drive the quality agenda. All of our leaders and, and managers are going through management training at the moment and we talked yesterday to some of the staff here about potentially rolling that out. Um, so there's a massive opportunity. I talked about the average wait time of five days from ready for care RFC um, we're, and we're doing that through a lot of automation. So our contouring at the moment um, is semi-automated we have now got some software called MIM. What MIM will do will automatically contour all normal tissue and organs at risk within seven minutes of the patient being CT'd. It automatically will pull down the patient's scans from the CT scanner and do the voluming of those structures and then it passes straight to the radiation oncologist. In terms of planning, we've developed up code using scripting. We can generate a prostate plan uh, fully compliant with CHIP in about 20 minutes with little manual intervention. A, a three level head and neck, uh, three dose level 70, 65 grey, 59 grey, we can generate a full automated plan in about 20 minutes and we demonstrated that to the team here in the UK last week. Our anal canal, lung, all automated. We've got our own scorecards. We measure quality through scorecards that we've generated so we can quickly present a report showing compliance of the plan against protocol. And all of our all of our plans are passing through full physics QA, but we're developing automation in that space to the extent that we should be able to complete physics automation QA within about 15 minutes without any of the physicists being involved in the reading. And we're doing that with a company called Sun Nuclear. Um, how does that translate? Uh, and this does really excite me. You can see in January, we had 25% of our patients in Australia on an IMRT or VMAT plan. And as of the end of September, we're at 70%. That's, that's a pretty big change curve if, if you think about training, quality assurance, documentation, protocols, but um, we're maintaining 70 and we're pushing to 80%. But what's been really interesting is the case study on the treatment times. You can see as we've implemented more and more VMAT, our treatment times have come down from 17 minutes to around about 10 minutes. And you'll hear a talk from Lauren today who'll talk a little bit about this and how that's really changed the whole quality and access dynamic in, in Adelaide. Uh, we're looking to partner, you know, with, with industry, so we're hoping to get the first MRI LINAC into, into one of the sites in Melbourne where we can start to deliver treatments to conditions that we just really can't deliver, including, you know, pancreas, liver and sarcomas. Uh, we're building connections with new companies around you know, interesting software. Uh, we've implemented deep inspiration breath hold from nothing to 100% in under 12 months, and we've got Half of our sites in Australia now delivering stereotactic to brain, lung and uh, uh, intracranial and oligometastatic disease. 
Now, all of our program, we really want to push towards survivorship programs where patients are actually enrolled on, on you know, exercise programs, so that's all part of it. And you can see one of the pictures there with the ECU, that's Edith Cowan University, that's an actual gym that's in one of our bunkers. So where we've got spare bunkers, we're implementing gyms and patients are on exercise programs as part of their, their whole care pathway. We're redesigning our whole dynamic around our website so that we can provide information to patients that's relevant to their disease. So they can log on and through their, their log on details they'll get access to their disease specific information. Um, employee engagement, I know I've run out of time so I'll just go over this but we're pushing really I think to try and get more engagement of our staff. 45% in 14, 52% uh, in 15. The latest survey has just been done and it's, it's around about 57%, so we're tracking, but we're not at 70% where we want to be. Uh, clinical productivity, more efficiency is, is really important, but in a quality area, so we've got lots to do there. LINAC utilisation, can we get to 45 patients a day? We're actually implementing a whole lean methodology in this place, so we're, we've engaged a lean team to help us really think about that. Uh, and, and lean's really interesting. It's, it's, it's engineering based, but it's actually helping us to identify where we've got bottlenecks. And um, I won't go too much into that, but looking at how we can save through our telecommunications and transports, but also with our equipment providers. Uh, we're doing a big project called Monarch, which I think you're involved in as well over here. And I know Neil's down the back, and I've seen Neil in Sydney um, really involved in this project. But how do we get better systems to help us actually save money as well? So that's a little bit about Cancer Service of the Future. Um, thanks for your time.